Hi everyone, we're going to learn about a specific proof technique called a direct proof. Now I'm going to back up a little bit. When we talk about proof techniques, a proof technique is basically a way of taking a statement and showing that it's true. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. A lot of them actually take advantage of some of the logical equivalencies that we are that we have sort of been learning for the first part of this class. So if we're talking about direct proof specifically, we we end up proving the statement that we're trying to show is true, correct in a very direct manner. And I'll talk about what that means. But basically what we're trying to do is the same way we're trying to prove correct or prove that is true is we'll always take the form of if P then Q specifically for a direct proof, it will always be an if P then Q statement. And what we're trying to show is that for our P and for our Q, if P then Q will always be true. So that's our task, is just using the knowledge that we have, all of our previously shown definitions and eventually some propositions, equivalencies, theorems, all that kind of stuff. We're going to use that to show that if P then Q is a true statement, depending on the P and Q, of course. So what we're going to do, our first step is we're going to assume P is true. Why are and and why are we assuming p is true? Well, if we assume p is false, then we're guaranteed for if p then q to be true. And this goes back to that whole promise thing that if I if p happens, then I promise q will also happen. Well, if p doesn't happen, then the promise doesn't cover anything like that. So it's basically if we assume that p is false, then the whole proof of that is trivial. So we don't even need to talk about that. So what we then need to show, what we actually really need to go and show is that if P is true, then Q must also be true for some reason. We have to show that Q is true because otherwise if Q is able to be false, then the whole statement is false. So in short, we're assuming that P is true and then we're going to take that knowledge. We're going to use P being equivalent to true definitions previously shown theorems and axioms. Well, we are going to use all of these in a way to form a, logic, a logical argument starting at assuming P is true and that will eventually get us to the conclusion Q is true. And that's a whole, that's all of, and that's what a direct proof is. We are starting at assuming P is true and we are making a direct path towards the conclusion that Q is true. So from here on out, the structure of this class is mostly just going to be, I'll hand you all a few definitions. We'll go over some examples of those definitions and then we'll do some proofs that involve those definitions. So this is an example of what that's going to look like. First, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define what an even number actually is. So an even number, you might recognize that an even number is, div is always divisible by two. And we're actually going to use that in our definition of even numbers. But we're going to be very careful about our words because we want our definition of even numbers to be as precise as possible. So what we'll do is our definition, we'll write let n be an integer n is even if this is where we're going to get into our predicate logic here there exists some k in the integers such that n equals 2k. So you can kind of think of this as being formatted as a uh, backwards conditional statement. So what we're saying is that if we can find a k such that n equals 2k, and also if n is an integer, then n is even. So that's our definition of even there. I'll give one more definition right now, and then we'll look at some examples of how we know when numbers are even or odd. So we'll let M 
be an integer. M is odd if there exists a K in the integers. I, want, I really want to point out that these, this k and this k are completely different. They're actually, they don't even have an assigned value right now um, just because we're working with a definition. So these are abstract integers k, and these are abstract integers n and m right there. So don't pay too much attention to the actual symbol that I'm using right here. It's more, we're trying to show, I'm trying to show what it means for an integer to be odd or even. So anyway, continue this continuing this definition, we'll say that our integer m is odd if there exists a k in the integers such that m equals 2k plus 1. So showing this as sort of a uh, conditional statement here, if we know that m is an integer and we can find a k such that m equals 2k plus 1, then we know that m is odd. And because these are definitions right here, we know that these are going to be true for really any integer. Uh, furthermore, I also want to point out that any integer within these two definitions are going to be, every integer will either be even or odd. There won't be any way for a number to be neither even nor odd or both even or odd just because of the way these definitions are structured. So let's say if we have some integer x and we can't find a k such that x equals 2k, then we're guaranteed to find some k such that x equals 2k plus 1. And that's just a really nice property of the integers right there. So let's look at some examples. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give different values of n or m, and I'll show the k that we need to find such that it shows that n, our uh, number here is even or odd. So if we have 2, for example, 2 is our integer we want to show is even or odd. But what we want to do is we want to find a k. So we can say 2 is equal to 2 times 1 right here. So 1, in this case, is going to be our k and 2 is our n. So because 2 equals 2 times 1, 2 is even. I'll do another one. Uh, 13. 13 equals 2 times 6, which is 12, plus 1. So in this case, this is our k, is 6. And because 13 equals exactly 2 times 6 plus 1, by definition of odd, 13 is odd. Let's do some negative numbers. So negative 10 is equal to exactly negative 2 times 5. So because of this, oh, sorry, I almost messed this up. Negative 10 is equal to negative 2 times 5, but we actually have to follow the definition of even right here. So we need to show that negative 10 is equal to 2 times something, not negative 2 times something. So we'll say that negative 10 equals 2 times negative 5. So that's why what I did was a mistake there, because in this previous line that I scratched out, negative I did negative 2 times something. But we need to follow the definition of even and show that n is equal to 2 times something. That's just what we chose to be. Oh, that's just what we chose to be our definition of even as we decided, OK, every number is even if it is equal to 2 times something. While it is true that all even numbers are also equal to negative 2 times something, we've sort of standardized the fact that we can show something is even if it's equal to 2 times something. So that's why I'm going to be really persnickety about this, is that by definition, we have to do 2 times something, not negative 2 times something. It just helps standardize everything. And the more standardization we have in terms of our definitions, the easier it is for us to communicate information and uh, really establish our thoughts well. Anyway, so one more right here. Negative uh, 13 equals, we'll do 2 times negative 7, which is negative 14 plus 1. Now, this kind of follow. Now, now the reason why I chose negative 7 for a k is sort of why I had to do 2 times negative 5 for 
this uh, definition of even up here is because we have to do two times something plus one to show that a number is odd. So we couldn't do two times negative six minus one. That wouldn't be kosher because our definition of odd, we've standardized that whenever m equals 2k plus one, then m is an odd integer. So because we have to work under that definition, because we have to always do two times something plus one, we have to, we have to choose negative seven for our k. Now, I'm not going to give you the answer to this one. Uh, if I remember to put it in the quiz, I do want to put it in the quiz and ask you all for your thoughts on this. But I want you to consider zero. Is zero even or odd? And if I'm on top of my shit, I will put in one of the quiz questions, is zero even or odd? And I want you to give me your reasoning why. So use the definitions of even or odd to tell me why you think zero is even or odd. All right, so here's the first theorem of the class. What we're going to do is we're going to let x and y be integers. We're, our, the theorem that we want to prove is that if x is even and y is odd, then x plus y is odd. So how do we go about doing this? Well, it might be helpful for us to take a look at what the theorem is structurally in terms of propositional and predicate logic. So. What we can do is we can start trying to create predicates here. So we'll do, let's say P of X is the statement X is even. Q of X, or sorry, Q of Y is the statement Y is odd. And R of X, Y is the statement x plus y is odd. What we are trying to do is we are trying to show that for all x in the integers, for all y in the integers, p of x and q of y implies r of x and y. So going back to what we were talking about in the predicate logic section of this class, what, we're, what we have is we have a couple of universal quantifiers here. So we're trying to say that this whole thing is true for all x and for all y. So it's not going to be enough for us to just choose specific values of x and y. Let's say x is 2 and y is 1. We can't just do that and say, okay, well, this whole thing is true. What we actually have to do is we have to show that this whole statement is true for every single X and for every single Y. So the plan for this is, is we're going to use arbitrary values. So basically what we're trying to show is that our logic will hold for some arbitrary even X and odd Y. And we're not going to know anything about x and y other than the fact that x is an even integer and y is an odd integer. And if we could show that our logic holds true, if we know nothing else about x and y, then we could substitute in any combination of integers. Uh, don't mind the Sharpie mark on my hands. Uh, we, can, we can substitute in any even and odd integers for x and y, and we'll be guaranteed for our logic to work. Now, I'll show what that looks like at the end. But using arbitrary values like this, basically keeping as little, giving X and Y in this case, or whatever variables you're using as little detail as possible so that you can show that a proof is true for any version of that variable, any, any value you could fill in there. That's going to be one of our probably most important tools in this entire class. So um, I'll try to show that technique off as much as I can and try to explain my thought process for why I'm doing certain things just to make it as clear as possible. But it's going to be a really important technique for us to try to keep as little detail in X and Y as possible. So over my time taking a bunch of mathematics classes and eventually starting to teach mathematics classes, I've sort of developed a three-step process to approaching proof questions. So the first step that I have listed here is do some examples to see if you believe in the theorem. 
So this is actually going to be really important. If you don't know what's going on with the theorem, if you if you're having a trouble understanding sort of intuitively, does this make sense to me or not, then you're going to have a hard time figuring out how to solve the problem as well. So I highly recommend doing some examples to, to see how you feel about it, to see like, okay, well, I'm getting a good sense of what this problem kind of looks like and how I'm going to approach this. Once you get that, then number two, what I want you to do is try to figure out your arguments ahead of time using scratch work. So sort of give yourself a low stress, low stakes environment where you're not worried about making it look good yet. I, I gave all those guidelines in the last video about what makes a good proof, but I don't expect you to be able to write out what I consider to be a good proof right away. Hell, I can't even write out a good proof first try. I always have to like spend a bunch of time figuring out the arguments for myself, uh, just writing everything out, making sure all the logic is sound. So I highly recommend you do the same. Just give yourself some time, list out your arguments, figure out the order in which you want to present them, and like collect all the evidence that you need in order to show everything. What's also helpful in scratch work is you try to figure out, okay, well, what am I going to need to prove in order to show that the theorem is correct? So all of that stuff is good scratch work material. Now, I'll, as an aside, I'll say that no, there's no one size fits all way to do scratch work. I'll be showing off my own way of doing scratch work and trying to highlight things that I think are really helpful for you to include in scratch work, but my scratch work is probably not going to look the same. That just comes down to you and I probably think a lot differently. I don't expect everyone to write out proofs the exact same way as me or go through the arguments of solving the problem correct, like solving the problem exactly the same way as I do. So scratch work is going to be a very personal thing, as is figuring out the way that your argument is going to work, figuring out the how you go about solving the problem and how you go presenting that information. So take every proof that I show you basically with a grain of salt, know that, oh, well, just because you may not have been able to figure out my way doesn't necessarily mean that you wouldn't have been able to figure it out your own way. And think about ways that make sense to you for solving the problem, because what's most important is that you can solve the problem in a way that makes sense to you. And once you can do that, it'll be so much easier for you to convince other people to write out that argument with your own knowledge and security that you're correct. So that's my aside there. Basically, do the scratch work to figure out what your argument is going to be ahead of time. Then in step three, you should write out the entire proof using those good proof gu guidelines. So actually, this is where you're going to start writing out a bunch of words rather than a bunch of mathy symbol stuff. So you're going to start citing things in a really nice and easy to read way. You're going to actually include explanations of what's going on. You'll, you'll use more words than you use any sort of mathematical notation, even though this is a math class. Like I said at the beginning, this is not a math class you've ever taken before, unless you've taken uh, any sort of high-level math class. So this is something else. You'll be, using a, you'll be using your words a lot. Now, I know we're computer scientists. We're not supposed to like using our words, but it's really important to write things out plainly in a way that can be easily understood. And math notation, especially because math notation can be pretty varied between people. I mean, I promise you that like probably the next person, your teacher for say 349 or any math classes you take or things like that will not use the same notation as me. So notation is not easy to keep consistent and it probably never will be ever completely consistent. But if you're using words to communicate your ideas, that will be a lot easier. It really does stand the test of time a lot better, despite the fact that our language is constantly evolving and et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, that's the whole, that's my uh, three-step process there. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run through this three-step process for the theorem that I just introduced. So I'm going to do some examples of adding an even X and an odd Y to get an even, uh, to get an odd X plus Y. Then I'm going to formulate the arguments. I'm going to collect why, you know, why those arguments are correct, and then I'm going to write it up nicely in a way that should be pretty understandable. I recommend, I highly recommend, when you're doing all, when you're doing proofs work for homework, which pretty much most of, if not all of your homework, I'll say most of, I'm pretty sure, most of your homework from here on out is going to be proofs homework in some way. So you will get used to this, honestly, you, you really will. Um, 
But what I highly recommend is actually including all of this work in your homework because it gives me a really nice way of saying, okay, well, this is what, oh, but, because if you include all this work in your homework, I actually have a really good way of knowing, okay, this is exactly how much you know about the problem. This is where you kind of got lost. And also I can give you like as much partial credit as possible, you know, partial credit's really nice. So even if say you didn't cite your explanation exactly correctly, but I can see in your scratch work that you did rely on that argument, that's going to be, a f that's going to be quite a bit less points off than if you just show me step three and then you don't cite something properly. So basically including all of these in your homework is going to be really helpful. It'll be really helpful for your grade. So yeah, three steps to uh, success right here. Okay. So let's talk about our theorem. If X is even and Y is odd, then X plus Y is odd. So let's start getting some random numbers for X and Y. Let's say if we have X is 40 and Y is 27, I'm just going to do the X plus Y right here. First off, X plus Y equals 40 plus 27 is 67, which is odd. It's not divisible by two. So we're good here. But I think I want us to go a little bit further. I, I just spent all that time talking about even and odd numbers. And clearly, I want, you know, I've just introduced this, this uh, definition. I wouldn't do it for nothing, right? I mean, I'm a professor. I love introducing stuff and then making you all learn things about it and practice those definitions. So we're going to need to use the, uh, we're, we're going to need to use this definition. So what I'm actually going to do is taking x equals 40 and y equals 27, I'm going to write them in terms of two times something and two times something plus one in these cases. So X is 40, which equals two times 20. Y is 27, which equals 26 plus one, which then equals two times 13 plus one. So when we have X plus Y, X plus Y equals two times 20, plus two times 13 plus one. And I'm not going to just multiply and add everything together quite yet. What I'm actually going to do is, since we're trying to work towards showing that X plus Y is an odd number, I'm actually going to try to make this look more like an odd number. So I'm basically going to make X plus Y turn into two times something plus one. And if we can make X plus Y look like the definition, look like two times an integer plus one, then we're good. That's all we need to show. So X plus Y equals two times 20 plus 13 plus one. And we can simplify this further. X plus Y equals two times 33 plus one. So X plus Y equals two times some integer plus one. So if we had these values for X and Y, and we went along this whole path, this would be a good way to show that X and Y are odd, like that. I'll leave any more, I'll leave any more examples to you all because uh, I'm spending quite a bit of time on this example. So what I'm going to do next is I'm actually going to move on to the scratch work to figure out the arguments right here. But what I wanna do is I wanna take the lessons that I learned from these examples right here the fact that if we have, if we separate X and Y into their sort of definition of even and odd forms, then we end up being able to create a definition of odd form for X plus Y. So this will be super useful for us. So now this is how I personally would approach scratch work. Again, there's no one size fits all way of doing this kind of scratch work, but this is how I sort of go over this in my mind. So what we have is we're going to get our even X. So X is even, Y is odd. What I've done right here, I'm basically writing out the assumptions that we're going to make. So again, I'm going to come back to the idea of a direct proof. We're trying to show something of the statement, if P then Q, and our statements right here are basically going to be if X is even and Y is odd. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to assume we're going to start off by assuming X is even and Y is odd. So 
That's why I've written out our assumptions right here. X is even, Y is odd. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to immediately apply as many definitions as possible. And right here we have two definitions that are going to be really useful, even and odd. So let's apply those definitions. Well, by definition of even, let me pull that up right here. By definition of even, if we have an integer, then the integer is even if it equals two times some other integer. So we're, we're assuming that X is even right here. So we're going to say if X, X, if X is even then, so we're going to say that if X is even, then X must be equal to some K times two where K is an integer or K is in the set of integers. I'm going to draw a little arrow from even to here. So that, so we know that's where that came from. Similarly, I'm going to say, okay, well, if Y is odd, then we know that that must mean Y equals two K plus one, except we can't use K again, even though we say K here, because we, we can do this in the definitions, given that these K's are in sort of different contexts. They're used in different definitions. But here, this is one problem. So we can't redefine K because this would be implying basically that if X equals 2K and Y equals 2K plus 1, Y will always equal X plus 1. But in our example, in our example right here, we show that this theorem still works even when X is 40 and Y is 27. So Y in this case is not X plus one. So what we have to do is we have to use a different letter and you can think of it in programming languages as sort of like, well, if we tried to define K to be something and then K to be something else, then we're overwriting this definition here. So we can't reuse letters like this. We have to use a different letter. So in this case, I'm actually going to say two times L plus one y equals 2l plus 1, where l is an integer. Now that I have all this done, I can't really go any further with defining things, so I'm going to now just take a look at x plus y. So x plus y right here, we want to find out something about x plus y. In this case, we want to show that x plus y equals 2 times something plus 1. And we don't really have much information on X plus Y, but we do know that X equals 2K and Y equals 2L plus 1. So we'll substitute some values in here. X plus Y equals 2K plus 2L plus 1. And now we can use the distributive property since 2 is multiplied by K and 2 is also multiplied by L. This is equal to 2 times K plus L plus 1. Now, this part is going to be a little bit tricky, so I'll try to tell you what you can do in this case. What we have is that K is an integer and L is an integer. And the reason for why we're allowed to do this is very complicated. It goes into all sorts of crazy stuff in the math major, um, all kinds of weird abstract algebra type of stuff, which is a super fun class, but it's not super fun when you don't even know the basics of proof yet. So. We're not going to worry about that. What you can do is you can say that if K is an integer and L is an integer, then K plus L is an integer. And this is important because by definition of odd, an odd integer has to be equal to two times some integer plus one. So we do have to fulfill, we have to say why K plus L is an integer because we need to show that we're fulfilling the definition of odd. Something we can actually do here is we can say, let's let M be equal to K plus L. And then we'll say that M is an integer because K plus L is an integer. And we'll just leave that there. Really the, the reason why this is, is it's a, it's a really nifty property of integers that sort of stems from a lot of really complicated axiom work. So, once we start talking about things like the piano axioms, I'll, I'll probably be able to explain this a little bit better, why an integer plus an integer is an integer. So if any of you are interested in that, let me know 
once we actually start talking about those axioms. Basically, though, we have m equals k plus l, and that m is an integer, so we have that x plus y equals 2m plus 1. Now, something else that's really useful for us to talk about in our scratch work is the conditions that we need to do to satisfy the theorem. So we've already assumed x is even and y is odd, so we need to show, well, we want to show, that's what this WTS means is want to show, x plus y is odd. Well, in order to do that, we need to show that x plus y equals 2 times a plus 1, where a is just some integer. So actually, that's another thing we need to show. a is an integer, and x plus y equals 2a plus 1. And these both come from definition of odd. Basically, just rip that from this definition right here. There exists a k in the integer such that our odd integer equals 2k plus 1. In this case, we're looking at a as an integer and x plus y equals 2a plus 1. So these are the conditions we need to meet. Well, in this case, rather than a, I've used m. Uh, but m is an integer and x plus y equals 2m plus 1. So we check off both of these requirements here. So because of that, we can say that x plus y is odd. So showing sort of the checklist that you need to figure out in order to show that x plus y is odd is actually really helpful. It helps sort of focus the direction you're going in your proof. So now because we have all this, then we can say that therefore x plus y is odd. And that's our scratch work. Okay, this is it. What we're going to do is we're going to actually show the uh, good version of this proof using all of the logic that we figured out in the scratch work, using all of our definitions that we figured out so far, which in this case is just the definition of even and odd, and making sure to cite everything as we go. So if you want to be fancy, and if you want to make it really much easier for me to see where your proof starts and ends, what you'll do is you'll start out your proof by writing pf and underlining it like this. It's kind of a standard notation that I've seen a lot of mathematicians use as they start out their proofs with pf. It just makes it a lot easier to see where your proof starts, which is very helpful if you have a whole lot of homework going on or if you're writing a really dense 200 page paper and you need people to figure out, oh, this is the start of a proof. So. What we have is we have the pf to start the proof. And then by our definition of what a direct proof is, we're going to start out with our assumptions. Now by our scratch work, we know that our assumptions are x is even and y is odd. So what we'll do is we'll start that we'll start out with that. So we'll say suppose x is even and y is odd. Now it's important to note that we don't need to specify x is an even integer and y is an odd integer because the definition of even and odd actually specifies that in this case x has to be even and that y has to be odd. So just saying that x is even or that y is odd gives us the information that x and y are integers. Now it's totally fine to say let x be and y be integers, suppose x is even and y is odd. That's totally fine, but that particular part isn't necessary because it's sort of implied in our definitions. Actually, it's implied right here where we're letting n be an integer and m be an integer. So if n and m aren't even integers, then this definition can't even apply anyway. So that's that. The other thing that we're doing is we're supposing x is even and y is odd. And I kind of touched on this a little bit when we were talking about the direct, what a direct proof actually is. But really, if x isn't an even integer or y isn't an odd integer, then it doesn't really matter because what we're trying to prove is that if x is even and if y is odd, that's what we care about is that those are the conditions for x plus y being odd. So anyway. Our first sentence is suppose x is even and y is odd. Now we're going to get from x is even to x equals 2k. So what we'll do is we'll say by definition, 
of even. So we're citing our definition before I even start talking about x. And you could put this before or after the x equals 2k part. It's fine, but as long as you cite that we're about to do this step, and we can do this step by definition of even. So what I'm doing, again, I'm making the proof more accessible by talking about why the logical step that I am making right now is possible, why I can say x equals 2k. So if I didn't say that, it would there would be a lot of people out there, I'm sure many of you watching this video might be confused, oh, well, why am I able to say x equals 2k? So that's why I'm being as clear as possible. Anyway, so by definition of even, I'm not just going to say x equals 2k. I'm first going to specify that there exists some integer k, or some k in the set of integers. And the reason why is, let's, let's say that we didn't specify k is an integer. Then that actually stops telling us a lot of things. Because, for example, if we, if we don't specify that k is an integer, well, 5 equals 2 times 2.5, so obviously 5 is even, right? And therein lies the problem. That's why we have to say that k is an integer, because otherwise we get into some weird shenanigans. So by definition of even, there exists some k in the integers such that x equals 2k. And then we'll do a similar sentence for y. So by definition of odd, there exists some L. And for the same reasons as I mentioned before, we're using L instead of K because we've already defined K up here. We don't want to imply that Y equals X plus one here because that's not necessarily always true. So there's ex there exists some L, no relation to K, such that, oh, sorry, L in the integers, such that Y equals 2L plus 1. So now we have all the setup, we can start attacking what X plus Y is. And remember that sort of by this checklist here, we want to show that x plus y equals 2 times something plus 1, where that something is an integer. So that's the direction we're trying to go here. And I guess, you know, we've already outlined what we're doing here in the scratch work. That's, what, that's why the scratch work is really nice, is because we can basically copy these, these sequences down and just making sure that we have citations for what we, you know, what we need to cite as needed. So... What we'll do is I'll actually just start with x plus y equals 2k plus 2l plus 1. So if we did any more definition at work of saying that, well, this is because the definition of even and odd, it would be a little bit redundant. So in this case, that's not necessary here. So if x plus y equals 2k plus 2l plus 1, then this x plus y equals 2 times k plus l plus 1. And normally, if I was being really persnickety, like extremely persnickety about what I want you to define here, I would say that this is by the distributive laws for numbers. But I'm also comfortable with y'all not needing to cite anything that you would have learned before algebra. So anything like the distributive laws or uh, commutative laws, things like that, we I'm fine with us not worrying about that. The definitions I really want us to worry about are the definitions that we started learning in class here. So things like distributive law for propositions, I would want you to worry about. But things like distributive law for numbers, I think we're okay without needing to specify that. Again, I want the level of clarity here to be if someone has taken basically all their prerequisite classes for 348 and have attended, you know, been watching the lecture videos up until this point, they should be able to know, okay, well, this is true because of just the distributive law for numbers. So that would be fine here. The things that you need to cite are the things like definition of even, definition of odd, the ones that are not really talked about up until this class. So anyway, we have x plus y equals 2 times k plus l plus 1. 
what I'll do now is I'll do that funky integer substitution thing here. So what we'll do is we'll say let m equal k plus l because k and l are in the integers, m is an integer. So x plus y equals 2m plus 1. We have everything we need. We have that x plus y equals 2 times something plus 1, and that something is an integer. So we can say, by definition of odd, x plus y is odd. And that's all we need to know. We started by assuming that x is even and y is odd, and then we proved that x plus y is odd as a result of our assumptions here. So what we'll do at the very end is restate the entire statement that we're trying to prove. And this is maybe a less mandatory part of the of proofs here, and I'll probably phase this out as we get more and more comfortable with proofs. But right now, this is a really good exercise in sort of wrapping up everything nicely. So therefore, if x is even and y is odd, then x plus y is odd. And the last thing we'll do is we'll close this proof. We'll, we'll symbolically show that the proof is done by writing something that basically was called a QED. Now QED means something fancy in Latin that I can't be bothered to remember. Basically, it's a very fancy way of saying our proof is finished. The way a lot of mathematicians will do it is they'll draw a box at the end. Sometimes that box is empty. This is a kind of a personal preference. It's almost like handwriting in this way, the way mathematicians like to do it. So sometimes the box is empty. Sometimes the box is full. Sometimes the box has a single line through it. That's usually how I do my QEDs. Uh, sometimes people do triangles or any sort of fun polygon. Sometimes people like to draw little cats, or I guess this is a more of a cat bat thing again. That's sort of, I guess, how I draw cats is as cat bats. You do a nice, uh, draw a nice little cat. What I want you to do is I want you to draw basically a happy symbol here. Something that's like, yeah, we did this. We finished this. So, you know, something that gives confidence and stuff like that. You can draw something fun if you want. I've seen people draw platypi. I've seen them draw sharks, uh, cats, all kinds of fun stuff. So, you know, really have fun with it is what I'd recommend. If you're not having fun with proofs, then, you know, what are you doing with your life? So this is our first proof. Congratulations. Um, you, this is the first step sort of of the rest of your mathematical and computer science careers, because now we have the basics of taking our sentences, taking our logical statements or our claims and showing that they're correct. And from here on out, we're only going to make our ways of showing things are correct. We're going to make those just more powerful from here on out. So yeah, good job, y'all. Congratulations on making it. We've done a lot in this class, so I really can't stress like how awesome it is that we've made it this far. Okay, well, I'm going to end the video here. In the next one, we'll keep on talking about direct proofs, but we're actually going to apply direct proofs to one of our discrete structures, to uh, sets. So we're going to learn how to prove things specifically about sets, which is a really cool area of proofs. So stay tuned for that.